Well, good morning, BCC family and all who are joining us for today's broadcast of our Sunday worship service here again at the Bedford Cross in beautiful downtown Bedford. We want to begin our service today with a call to worship as we do each week. We begin our service in the Word of God and we spend our service in the Word of God through songs and through the preaching of God's Word and through our response to it. And so hear the Word of God from Psalm 122, an appropriate one for us today. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. And then this verse, which is so appropriate for the times in which we live, Psalm 122, verse 6, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will say, seek your good. I know all of us are horrified by the images that we're seeing out of the Holy Land. And we want to pray for all parties involved that peace would reign. Because we know that this region is very close to the heart of our God. And so we want to pray that war would cease, that especially terror and violence would cease, and that God would reign supreme over all things and bring peace. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this Lord's Day celebration and for the fact that we're gathered through this uh, medium of video to be able to worship you. We thank you for the fact that you call us your people. That is by your grace and not by our own doing. And so, Lord, we lift our voice today because our hearts are broken over all that is going on in the Middle East. We pray, God, that you would bring peace. And we pray that somehow, by the work of your Holy Spirit, moving upon leaders, that war and terror and violence would cease. We thank you and pray today for the peace of Jerusalem, just like David instructed in Psalm 122. And we thank you that one day all wars will cease, all suffering will be behind us, and you will usher in a new Jerusalem, a new kingdom, where peace will reign under the authority of your kingship. We thank you for this. We worship you and await that day. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to rise right where you are, and let's lift our voice in worship to the Prince of Peace. Don't lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. And there is peace in the storm, in the storm. No, don't forget, He is Lord, He is Lord of all. There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in awe. Cause there is one, only one, where my help comes from. There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. Mm 
Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound. Just one name over all. Jesus reigns, he reigns. I know the nations bow, mountains shake. The sound of just one name over all Jesus reigns. I know there is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. He was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still, behold him. You dine with sinners and saints, heal the blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now, He's in our midst. Behold Him. He chose a criminal's end, paid with blood to settle our debt. Very debt, He rose to life. Behold Him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. Oh, be still and behold Him, Jesus, Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior.
our God, the risen Savior. Oh, be still, behold Him. Behold Him. Good morning and welcome to Bedford Community Church. My name is Deanna Pastor, and I'm the Director of Growth Groups here at BCC. We're so glad you're with us. Here are this week's announcements. You ready for this? Danny, I was born ready. Let's okay. go. Let's go. Okay. What's the capital of Minnesota? St. Paul. Harder. Okay. Who was the seventh U.S. president? Martin Van Buren. Harder. Okay. What is the square root of 15,129? 123. Come on, man. Harder. Oh, snap. Okay. What's the definition of poppin'? Uh, the street name for Mary Poppins. No. The street name for popcorn? No. Wait, I know this. Uh, tell the folks what's coming up while I figure it out. Folks, we invite you to a fun event called Game Time on Sunday, October 15th. It's going to be after the second service. We'll have pizza and fun games. All are welcome. If you're interested, reach out to Lisa Bruno. It's going to be popping. Did I use it right? Nailed it. Game time. Let's go. Let's go. Friends, we are dedicating November to show appreciation and gratitude to those who serve our community. And we wanna do that in two ways. First is Thank You Tuesday. As a church, we're gonna bless all of our Bedford first responders, as well as the Bedford Town Hall, Parks and Rec Department, and the Highway Department. You can get involved by making home-baked treats, help drop off these treats, write a thank you note, or give financially to provide a meal for our first responders. And the second way that we wanna show appreciation is through the Gratitude Challenge. Now, in November, we are gonna create a wall of gratitude in the main hallway. And on that wall, there will be 200 empty squares. Why 200? Well, we want you to bless someone in your community. It could be your neighbor, your crossing guard, a teacher, your favorite barista, it can be anyone. So give them a small gift and let them know how they've blessed you. Afterwards, come to church, fill out a post-it note, write down who you blessed and stick it on an empty box on that wall of gratitude. At the end of November, we want to see every single box, 200, filled. We can do this. For more information, please reach out to me after service. Friends, you and your friends are invited to Pumpkin Palooza on October 29th after our 11 a.m. service. We want you to enjoy one of those company with kid-friendly games, pumpkin painting, face painting, and some trunk or treat. Now, we still have 10 spots available for folks who want to decorate their cars for a trunk or treat. If you're interested in doing that, or if you want to help out with manning our games or pumpkin painting, please reach out to me after service. Thank you. Friends, we are so thankful for your generosity. You are giving funds all of the ministries here at BCC. We believe that God is our source for all things and our giving is an act of worship. If you would like to give, there are four ways to do so. Online on the BCC website, on the BCC app, through the mail, and in person. Thanks for joining us today. Make sure you stay connected with us throughout the week. Online on our website, our app, Instagram, or our YouTube channel. Enjoy the service. Well, good morning again, BCC family and all who are joining us for today's broadcast. Today we continue our fall sermon series entitled, We the Kingdom, Becoming the Church God Calls Us to Be. This exciting series has been merging passion and vision and action, and it kind of sets the trajectory for the church for years to come. It lays out the very heart of God for His global church, as expressed in the first four chapters of Revelation and really for us as a church at BCC. If you've missed any of the episodes, please take time, go back and listen to them at our Bedford Community Church YouTube channel or on our BCC app, which you can download from the App Store on your smartphone. We continue today in the book of Revelation, chapter two. So let me invite you to open there, beginning in verse 18. Turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter two, and verse 18, today we study the fourth of seven letters 
written to the seven churches scattered throughout Asia Minor. I'm going to read through the passage and then we'll spend our time together in today's word. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, says this from the English Standard Version of the Bible. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat foods sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's word. Pray with me if you would. Lord, we give you thanks for your message to the churches and how it applies to us today. These words are for a church located on the other side of the world that existed some 2,000 years ago. And yet the miracle of your living word is that these words are for us today in the United States in 2023. Would you meet us in your word? Would you open our minds and our hearts to receive the truth of your gospel offered through the feeble, inadequate words of a fallen human being, but anointed by your Holy Spirit to bring hope and truth and life to all who would receive them. And so God, do that now in the miracle of your preached word by the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you glory and honor as we sit and attend to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Today, we talk about purity in the church. Now, I understand that even the mention of the word purity evokes a myriad of responses. For many of us who were raised in the church, the foundations of Christian moralism lead us to understand that purity is first and foremost a sexual standpoint. But as we'll unpack today, purity includes that and yet goes far beyond what we do with our bodies. I want to be very sensitive here today because the discussion of purity inevitably invokes memories of what was dubbed the evangelical purity culture, a fad that swept the Christian culture over the last several decades and has done incredible damage to people and to relationships and to churches throughout this time period, even up to this day. One of the flashpoints of this movement is a man by the name of Joshua Harris. In 1997, at just 23 years old, he released a best-selling book called I Kissed Dating Goodbye, and he became an overnight sensation. He, he kind of became the poster child for purity culture and the movement therein, and he contributed to the growing reality of shame-based sexuality that dominated the Christian landscape of the late 1900s and early 2000s. Whereas the Bible outlines the gift of biblical sexuality, the legalistic moralism of fundamentalist male leaders sought to control and manipulate the masses through guilt, fear, and shame. Oddly enough, the story was not done there. Harris would later become the lead pastor of a church where revelations of past sexual abuse would cause his mentor to resign in disgrace. After years of hearing the pain of what the Christian purity culture had inflicted, Harris not only left ministry, he left the Christian faith altogether. He and his wife of over 20 years divorced soon thereafter. Today, Joshua Harris runs a consulting and coaching firm and has jettisoned the Christian faith with all of its rigidity and judgment. 
So in this one man's life, we see kind of both sides of how Christianity can be toxic. First, we see it viewed as law. God is the great rule giver, and our job is to follow the rules. Leaders in the churches are put there to enforce the rules. And if we follow the rules, we remain pure in word and deed, and are thus acceptable to God. But on the other side of the coin is license. As a person with free will, I'm given the right to decide what's best for me, and I will act upon this with things I willfully choose. No person or religious construct is going to impede my personal autonomy to decide what's best for me. Both of these constructs are deeply flawed, and neither is Christian. But it begs the question, how can we live in the world and yet not be of the world? How can we be people of both truth and grace? Well, Christ himself offers a third way, not legalism, nor licentiousness, but love. The sacrificial love of God offered to us and the corresponding response of our love, both for him and others, willfully offered as a sacrifice of worship. This, this is the picture of what Christianity lived out looks like. And this is what leads a church to be a pure church. This type of love doesn't seek to control or manipulate. This type of love doesn't turn a blind eye to intentional sin or idolatry. No, this type of love is the embodiment of Christ who is both full of grace and truth. And this is what he calls his church to be. Today we're going to look at a church that struggled with this construct of purity in both doctrine and in praxis. And the implications for all involved are substantial. So substantial that we, 2,000 years later, would do well to take heed of the words of Christ to this church because these words are for us as well. Join me at Revelation chapter 2 beginning in verse 18. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18 says this, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead, and all churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. So as we do each week, let's again reorient ourselves with the text. Thyatira was a city 45 minutes due east of Pergamum, the city whose letter Pastor Kelvin addressed in last week's sermon. It was a trade city known for its commerce in wool, linen, apparel, leather, tanning, and bronze work. And associated with this was what scholars identify as an extensive trade guild or labor union network. Now this is where it gets sticky. To be part of the guild or the union, there were patron deities, feasts, and other activities that were compulsory for all members. This included what the Bible would recognize as immoral behavior, including sexually immoral behavior. This was the purity crisis of Christians in ancient Thyatira, and it's the same for us today. You and I live in a world where we are expected to adhere to cultural standards. And if we do not conform to these world, worldly standards, then you and I will be ostracized. We live in the reality of groupthink, whether it's the treadmill of corporate America with all of its conformity to workaholism and commitment to the bottom line, or maybe it's the demands of the social expectations and norms within all levels of society itself, which call us to conform at all costs. I've experienced this throughout my life in a myriad of ways. Uh, we learn it growing up, conform or be cast off. When we're kids, there's the power of peer pressure to make us fit in. As we grow into adulthood, the surroundings change, but the demands to conform remain. The word for this is syncretism. Now, I know that Pastor Kelvin talked about this last week, but it bears repeating again this week because it appears in several of the letters of the churches in Revelation. The Oxford Dictionary defines syncretism as this, the amalgamation or attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures, or schools of thought. In short, syncretism is the attempted fusion of two things that shouldn't go together. And for the Church of Jesus Christ, 
This has always been the issue at hand. The church throughout its 2000 year history has always warred against the influence of the world as opposed to influencing the world around it. And in Thyatira, there was a frontline battle within the church. While in Pergamum last week, they were warned that some in the congregation had given themselves over to syncretism, Thyatira was strongly rebuked because it allowed this teaching to actually infiltrate leadership. Look at verse 20 with me. Immediately after they were commended for their works and love and faith and endurance, they're called out for their tolerance of Jezebel, a false prophetess. Now, let's press pause for a moment and dig into the scholarly material that we have on this passage. Most theologians believe that there was a woman that had been elevated to leadership in this church that was teaching and encouraging the congregants to engage in the trade, guild, pagan rituals that I spoke of earlier. These rituals would include, as verse 20 states, sexual immorality and feasts honoring pagan deities. And look at the next verse. This false prophetess was being judged by God as were all her children or those who followed her teaching. She had been given the opportunity to repent, but refused. And now those who follow her are given their last chance to repent or they face judgment. Verse 23 ends with God stating that his judgment on her and her followers will be an example to all that God is the one who searches the mind and heart of all people and judges them accordingly. So let's let's stop here and ask an important question. What do we do with a passage like this? I I mean, this is scary, fire and brimstone stuff, right? This is the reason why some of us resist the Bible and the God that it talks about. Who wants to hear about deceptive false teachers and sexual immorality and God's judgment of tribulation and death? Well, let's return to what we talked about earlier so we can tie this all together, shall we? Remember that we discussed that there are two false ways of living, legalism and licentiousness. But the third way, the third way of love The way of God is the way of love. I said this before, you've heard me say it, that God cannot be a God of love if he's not a God first of justice. Love demands righteous anger against that which threatens the object of said love. So all judgment that we read in scripture from Genesis to Revelation is God's righteous judgment born out of his love for his church. And he will judge all legalism and licentiousness that do violence to his beloved people. And that's why judgment begins with leaders. I want to talk about this as a church and the implications therein. First, God's calling us at BCC to be set apart from the world, to not be syncretic in our living. That means whatever pressures you feel from the world around you to conform, you filter all of those through the Word of God and you live according to the standard of who you really are in Christ. Listen, I know it's hard, but you have a choice. This is where we trust God and we do what's right even when it costs us. Second. We as a church must take serious this issue of sexual immorality. The culture around us has gone off the rails in the issue of sexuality and gender, and it has infiltrated the church even at the highest levels. I don't know if you've seen in the news over the last couple of weeks, but it's been highlighted that two church leaders, two well-known church leaders, have been evolving in their views of historical biblical sexuality. Do not be deceived. We must stand our ground in both grace and truth and hold on to what the Word of God says about how we use our bodies. Finally, leaders in the church must be held to high standards. We need to think about this now as we nominate new leaders for our church in the month of October. Public service announcement, nominations are open. Reach out to the church office if you have any questions about how to nominate someone. Jesus addresses the fact that Jezebel was given leadership and with that leadership, she deceived in both doctrine and deed. Church, we must ensure that our leaders are held to high standards of orthodoxy in doctrine and purity in life. For this reason, you may have heard we instituted a leadership covenant here at BCC this past year. Its purpose is simple, to clearly articulate the expectation that people in leadership positions at BCC will live by God's grace as people who are guided by scripture in every facet of their lives. This covenant is not legalistic, This covenant instead warns against licentiousness. And most of all, this covenant is motivated by love, love for God and love for each other. We have a sacred responsibility to do all that we can to ensure the purity of Christ's church, not by behavior modification, but by being a gathering where life transformation takes place. And for those who choose by God's grace to live this way, unspeakably 
great things await. Let's finish the text and see what they are, beginning in verse 24. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and when earthen pots are broken to pieces, even as I myself received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The cost of being a Christian in Thyatira was great. Their faithfulness to Christ would cost them their family, their homes, their jobs, their standing in society. Eventually, it would cost even some of them their lives. And God knew all of this. Listen, this life is filled with trials, difficulty, testing. You and I are being refined day by day through life circumstances and through difficulties that we encounter. But as with every letter addressed to the churches in Revelation, there is a glorious promise of what is to come. Look at verses 26 through 28. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Church, this is what awaits us as we remain faithful to God. I want to end today by addressing the elephant in the room. There, there are many of us here today, we are greatly troubled by what we see around us. I'll take a moment just to enumerate some of the things that would cause us great fear. This is just a short list. The current conflict in the Middle East, the current conflict in Ukraine, the state of our nation politically, socially, economically, and spiritually, and the declining state of the church in the Western world. Then there's the burden that each of us carry individually, and we all have them. This is where I would love to tell you that God's going to rescue you from all of the problems of your life, that you'll be shielded from all the chaos that's going on in the world around us. But see, that's not the message to the churches in Revelation, and it's not what's happening in real time in the world around us. God is testing us, refining us through trials and tribulations to make us pure. So today, I, I really wanted to end the sermon differently. I want the words of Scripture to be the final words of this sermon. See, as your pastor, I, I'm, I'm often guilty of trying so hard to encourage you, to inspire you, to comfort you. And I want to ask your forgiveness for that because it's born out of a genuine love that I have for each of you as your pastor. But you don't need my inspired pep talk. You need the truth of God and His great and precious promises. That and the power of His Spirit is all that you need to see you through any trial that you will face in this life. Hear the words of James chapter 1, verses 2 through 12. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Pray with me if you would. God, we thank you that you are the one that sustains us, that you are the one that through trials makes us pure, refined, sparkling like gold. God, would you help us to face the realities of our world and to face the challenges of our lives with courage, with joy, and with the assurance that great things await us. Lord, this gives us joy in this life and assurance in the life to come. And so help us to recognize that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
And as long as we remain rooted, as long as we endure until the end, the crown of life awaits. Thank you for this, God. This is your gift through your life, through your death, through your resurrection, through your ascension. Thank you. Receive this closing song as an offering of worship to you that we might go forth and live as beacons of light in this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to rise right where you are and let's lift our voice in this closing song of praise to God. blood and righteousness and I did not trust the sweetest strength but holy trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness and I did not trust the sweetest strain but holy trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the same seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace As in every eye and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Me. Hey. 
in the Savior's love through 